All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, let's move to our presentation tonight. We have a great technical presentation. It's coming from uh, Leon NT8B and Mike KD4MM. And we're going to hear all about NFED half-wave antennas. Okay, so we're going to speak about NFED half-wave antennas. Uh, this is a presentation that um, um, uh, Mike McNaughty, um, Katie Four, Mike, Mike, and I have put together. And this is uh, to maybe to begin to kind of address Don's question. This is going to be a very practical presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about how these are put together, but um, what we're going to talk about is our experience with these antennas, how we build them and how we've used them and the success that we've had with them. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to get tangled up in a, in a lot of the science and questions about whether they work or whether they don't. I'm just going to show you the results of what we've done just based on practical experience. And I think you'll see, to Don, to answer your question, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. So we're going to talk a little bit about why were we interested in using uh, NFED half-wave antennas since they had a bad rap? Why even bother with them? So we're going to talk about why we became interested in these antennas I'm going to give a little bit of background information on how they came about and how they're put together um, and then how we set them up. Uh, we, the, the focus of this presentation is going to be on portable operations. So I'm thinking of parks on the air activations, summits on the air activations. We're actually now beginning to use them in our field day events. So any type of a situation where you want to quick up and quick down, that's where we're using these antennas. We're going to talk about the performance we've observed. This is where the proof comes in the pudding and uh, then how to how to build one. And then I've got a bunch of references at the uh, end of the uh, presentation that um, I'm just going to gloss over at the end. But this presentation will be put on on the uh, on our website so you can refer back to it if you want to find uh, references and sources for materials in case you want to build one. OK, so here we go. So when Mike and I, we got started doing portable operations, actually, our first portable event, little did we know, was way back whenever we did our special event honoring Reginald Fessenden, and we went down, what was the island? I don't remember, Cobb Island. We went down to Cobb Island, and we set up a station, and it was the first time we'd gone out. You should have seen us. We had our spud gun. We were launching lines into trees and putting up dipoles, and we had a really successful activation, but uh, we said to ourselves after we're done, there's got to be a better way. And so the the better way has uh, rolled us to the uh, use of the um, uh, the NFED half wave. So we wanted something that was, especially for our soda for our POTA operations, we wanted something that was small and portable that could be used in these events. We wanted something that is much easier to deploy than the example that I just gave. And then something that's got a manageable footprint that's not intrusive or destructive. And the reason that's important is that we've run in in some parks. We've run into some real tough to deal with rangers who want us to leave the place without a scratch. And so when we set these things up, we have to have a way to put them up without leaving any kind of a trace whatsoever in some situations. It's nice if the antenna operates on more than one band, because if you want to switch bands, you don't have to change antennas, of course. And then we wanted to make one ourselves. And then finally, we wanted something, of course, that had good performance. So we've settled on the NFED half and uh, half wave antenna. And you'll see that we've met most of these. We've actually, we've met all of these criteria. So I'm going to walk through half wave antennas and you'll see that. Um, uh, the, the, well, we'll just start with the dipole. This is a simple dipole, classic dipole antenna. Um, we know that dipole antennas are uh, cut to be one half wavelength long. The standard center fed, uh, half wave dipole is fed in the center. Uh, the arms are the same length, one quarter wavelength. And, um, the input impedance at the feed point on these antennas is roughly plus or minus 75 ohms. And so, when we use 50 ohm coaxial cable, we have a pretty decent match. And so when we set these up, we often add a common mode choke to um, deal with common mode currents. But uh, these antennas work quite well. The issue with them is, is that at least for a portable operation, you really need three points to hang them up. And um, uh, they're only, they only operate on one band unless you, you put traps or sometimes you can like a 40 meter dipole, you can operate it on 15 meters, but basically they're single band antennas. So then what folks have done, as I'm sure most of you know, is that what you can change the location of the feed point on a half wave antenna, um, sliding it down so that, um, it's not in the middle and, 
there are several different ratios that folks employ when they put these antennas together. Some are designed so that uh, 20% of the, uh, it's 20% of lambda, so it's basically 80, 20 feed, 25, 75, and then one third and two thirds. And it turns out that the input impedance uh, on these antennas is plus or minus about 200 ohms. And so when, when folks set these up and use them, um, they employ a four to one impedance transformer so that the, uh, there's a better match between the 50 ohm feed line and the 200 ohm impedance of the antenna. Now, this antenna has the disadvantages again that it needs three points to set up, but it does have the advantage over the center fed dipole in that, um, it will tune on more than one band and the number of bands that tune depend on uh, how how you set up the antenna and where you place the feed point, but they can be used as multi-band antennas. So then the next step in all of this is to move the feed line all the way to the end of the half-wavelength antenna, and here's where the uh, end-fed half-wave antenna comes in. And it turns out here that the input impedance on this antenna is really high. So it's a uh, high-voltage low current feed point for this antenna. So the, the feed point impedance here is between 2,500 and 3,000 ohms, again, depending on the frequency that you're using. So the way we deal with that, again, is to employ an impedance matching transformer. And in this case, the, um, the, 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 the transformer uh, it operates on a ratio of 1 to 49, so that the 50 ohms pretty close uh, is pretty close to matching the 2,500 ohms. And uh, so this is the basic setup of the NFED half-wave antenna. Now, some people uh, argue that it's a good idea to employ the use of a counterpoise. The uh, recommendations on the counterpoise is to use uh, 0.05 lambda, so 0.05 of the wavelength of the lowest frequency of the antenna you're going to use. So um, <clears throat> in this case, it would be... Uh, 0 0.05 of a, if it's a 40 meter antenna, be 0 0.05 of a roughly 63 foot antenna. So it's a really short piece of wire that can be attached to the negative side of the, um, of the feed point of the antenna. And then, uh, I'll, I'll just comment that I've tried operating this antenna both with and without a counterpoise, and I don't see any different with or without. So I never use one. We just don't use the counterpoise, but, uh, you'll see recommendations for using it. And then, the other thing people talk about is putting a common mode choke uh, on the antenna, again, at a pretty good distance away from the feed point of the antenna. Um, there's only been one time whenever I've ever felt the need to use a common mode choke, and that was at the last field day when I had the, the uh, transformer up in a tree with about a 20-foot feed line into the tent that was right below the um uh where the feed was and i hit the key to transmit some cw and everything just shut down so uh i solved the problem by adding more coaxial cable i put another 50 feet of feed line uh on the 20 foot feed line and put a common mode choke on the end of it and all my problems disappeared but that's the only time in any of the operations that i've ever felt the need to use a common mode choke so again Normally, we don't ever use one, but again, you'll see recommendations that uh, one be employed. So that's the basic structure of the uh, NFED half wave. Now, um, it turns out, and again, I'll show you some examples of this, that um, it's real flexible in how it can be installed. You can install it horizontally, uh, and if you were out at our last field day, you'll see an example of where we, we more or less had some horizontal in installations they can be sloped with the feed point quite low to the ground and the, the far end of the antenna wire up in a tree. Uh, they can be uh, operated vertical. Um, if, if we're stuck in uh, a place where there's, um, uh, you know, limitations in, in what you can place and what you can set up, um, this is a 10 meter a mast. And so I've run a 10 meter piece of wire which is half wave for 20 meters up this uh, mass that I've extended and operated an end fed on 20 meters is a complete vertical and it works great. So uh, you, it's, it's very flexible in, in how you can um, set it up and you can do inverted L's and all kinds of different shapes. So it's very flexible in, um, in how you set it up. And then tuning, it turns out that these are, 
good multi-band antennas. And the way this works is, so for example, if you have a 20 meter and fed half wave, uh, it'll tune very nicely on 14 meters and then, and then on 14 megahertz on 20 meters. If you take the 14 times two, 14 times two is 28. So it also turns out that it'll tune on 28 megahertz. And it works the same with a 40 meter and fed half wave. So, um, it's, uh, lowest frequency it operates is on seven megahertz. And then seven times two is 14. Seven times three is 21. Uh, seven times four is 28. So it operates on the multiples of the, of the base frequency of the antenna. And then things get really interesting with an 80 meter antenna. So if you take 3.5 megahertz and walk through the same math, you'll see that it'll tune on all of the uh, bands, um, including the work bands, uh, from uh, 3.5 megahertz up to 30 megahertz. So it's it's really quite an interesting antenna. And um, I'll show you an S- SWR sweep that, um, uh, that that verifies what I'm just talking about in a minute. So the other thing that I've employed are links to use on, I'll just call them off bands. I didn't know what else to call them, but for example, uh, on this 20 meter vertical antenna that I just mentioned, I've got a link in this, um, in the wire there. So if I want to operate on 15 meters, I just pull the link and, and the link is set so that, uh, the, the vertical antenna tunes on 15 meters. So not only can I operate on, uh, 20 meters and 10 meters, if I pull the link, I can also use the antenna to operate on 15. So you can use links like this to, um, uh, extend the utility of the antenna and, and operate it on different bands. I don't know if you're familiar with these little links. They are little little brass banana plugs. You can just solder them in line. They're really small. You just pull them out and plug them back together. They work really well for this situation. Okay, well, what about the performance of this antenna? So the first thing I'm going to show you is some SDR plots, uh, SWR plots, um, that we've generated from our various operations. So the first one is a simple 40 meter and fed half wave antenna. And the, the, the line on the top is, um, the standing wave ratio. And, um, uh, we'll just focus on that. So you can see that and, and where the lines are, this is SWR of two. This is SWR of one and this is SWR of three here. And you can see whenever we sweep across the band with a typical 40, meter wire cut and fed half wave uh just as i mentioned it uh, tunes on 40 meters 20 meters most of 15 meters and 10 meters um it's below an swr of three to one across all of, all the bands you're, saying tune, but you're not using a tuner right we don't use a tuner typically so it's resonant okay maybe that's a better word to use thank you the engineers here in the crowd well the old biologist doesn't know what he's talking about so the engineers will tell me to use the term resonant. So it is resonant, as you can see. But the other thing is, is that our radios, when they do have um, tuners built into them, the point I was about to make is that um, it, it, across all the bands, the SWR is less than three to one, which is easily handled by most tuners that are built into radios. Okay. Uh, another example is... Uh, This is one of our homebrew 80 meter end fed half waves that we used at field day last year. This is a sweep from um, Mike's um, uh, SWR meter. And uh, uh, what what this shows is this is uh, 80 meters. This is 30. This is uh, uh, four. uh, Sorry. Yeah. 80, 40, 30, 20, 17, 15, 12 and 10 meters. So, uh, you see that there there is resonance on on each of those frequencies as I just mentioned, and then um, I also have a one of these cut for thirty meters, and so this is the sweep of um, of the antenna where the wire is cut for uh, at a half way for thirty meters, and again the antenna is uh, is resonant as it's shown right here. So again, they're very flexible. You can cut the wires for whatever length you want and use them and, and work whatever bands you want. And then the last last point to make is um, the couple of VWS members uh, on the antenna team went over to um, Frank's QTH W4NUA and put an NFED half wave antenna cut for 40 meters in his attic. And it's not the real, really the world's most ideal situation, as you can imagine. 
Um, but again, um, the SWR sweep shows that uh, the antenna tunes on, um, whoops, and it tunes on uh, 40, 20, 15, and 10. But also interestingly enough, for some reason, I know, Mike, we've, we've talked about this. We don't know why, but uh, it was resonant on 30 meters as well. And uh, I think Frank's experience with this antenna has been pretty good as far as I know. So, <laughs> so at any rate, it does work and, and you, you can use them in, in uh, a broad range of, um, of applications. Okay. So my good friend Lee Garlock. 84RE always tells me, Leon, you can't use SWR as a measure of an antenna performance because, of course, if you put power into a dummy load, you'll get uh, you'll get resonance in a great SWR. <laughs> so, so the question is, is this a dummy load, or do these antennas really work well? So, what I want to do is give you three examples of um, operations where where we've used the unfed antennas. And one of the nicest examples was winter field day. So this was just a couple of months ago. We were over at the scout house property and um, we ran a 2-0 state uh, operation. So we had two uh, radio stations running and we had one end fed half wave that was cut for 40, one for 80. And we also used a buddy hex. But anyway, what I did here was I've uh, got, uh, I made a map uh, from it's, it's called qsomap.org. And you can take your ADF file and send it to them, and they'll send you back a beautiful map of all your contacts. So what I did was I accumulated all of the contacts we made on the two NFED half-wave antennas that we used during the event. And um, we have over 600 contacts with the NFED half-waves, and um, they, they, the contacts we made were on uh, uh, 80 meters, uh, 40 meters, and 15 meters. And you'll see that... Uh, of these of these contacts, a whole lot of them, first of all, but uh, these contacts all range from as far west as Hawaii. Thank you, Leaf, who worked really hard to get that contact and uh, across in, in the west coast up into Canada, down into Puerto Rico, but then on 40 and 80 meters, you can see that that we worked all across the U.S. So it worked really well. Those two antennas worked really well for us at Winter Field Day. And then this uh, give you a couple of examples of parks on the air activations that we've done. This is uh, Mike and I went out to um, uh, the Prince William Forest. And it was a great day, a uh, uh, 100 or so contacts uh, as far west as uh, Alaska and uh, all over the U.S. and then uh, into Europe from Spain all the way up into Finland. So that was a great day. And then uh, another example, just to show you that it's not an accident, this was Another activation that we did at Lake Frederick. And again, nice contact um, with a station way up here in British Columbia across the U.S. and again back into Europe. So uh, the proof is in the pudding here. These antennas, at least for the portable types of operations that we do, work really well for us. Okay, so how do you set these things up and use them? It, it, as I said, we wanted something that was really easy and straightforward to use. So... Um, the the thing that we really like to do is to get the the end that's farthest away from the transformer up as high as we can. And one of the things that works real well for us in the parks is to use one of these arborous weights. And if we get good at it, we can fling the, uh, if we practice, we can fling this weight between 25 and 30 feet up in the air, usually, usually get it across the branch that we're aiming at. And uh, when it goes up there, uh, we just pull the wire up and then, we extend the wire out until it's straight. Um, sometimes the park rangers aren't happy to have us put a rope, a little rope like this in a tree, believe it or not. So if that's the situation, if they give us any static about that, what we can do is use um, uh, extendable fiberglass mass. And this is an example um, where Mike and I were out on an activation and uh, we found this handy fence post, and we just bungee corded the uh, fiberglass mass, you can see here, uh, to the fence post. And then this is a picture um, it's farther back, and you can see here um, fairly easily, you can see this is a 12-meter spider beam fiberglass mast. It's a little hard to see right here, but the, uh, the end-fed half-wave wire is running right down to here. And the little transformer that we use, the 1 to 49 transformer, is mounted on the fence. And then the feed line, of course, you can't see it, but it runs from the uh, from the transformer down to where we were operating. So um, you can use a fiberglass mass to to raise the end of the antenna. 
Um, the other thing that um, we use is just if even if you don't have a tree and you don't have any posts around, I was in a situation where I activated a park in Pennsylvania and uh, another park I was down in Texas and there was just there were no trees or anything to attach it to. So uh, this little setup works really nicely. So this is a 10 meter fiberglass mast that's uh, made by a, uh, or at least provided by a vendor in Germany called DX Wire. And um, what I've done here is mounted this um, mast on a, uh, these things are called um, portable electric fence posts. You can get them at Lowe's and Tractor Supply. And um, you can see what, what they have here. They have a little, little metal spike uh, on the bottom and uh, you can put it down on the ground. And then there's a, a handy little step here. So, when you're out and you want to put it down in the ground, you just put it down. You can just step on it and it just goes right straight into the ground. And if it's not too windy and if the ground isn't too soft, uh, this mass, you, you can raise it up and it'll stand there very nicely. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes either it's windy or the ground is just not strong enough to keep the antenna from falling over when you put it in by itself. I got some um, some more of these posts and sawed them off. And um, what you can do is you can set these up as like little little guy little guy supports on the outside, and then you can guy uh, attach the little ropes here uh, to the uh, to the top of to the top of the fiberglass mass. So you have three three little ropes here, and it provides support to keep the the mass from toppling over. And then you can attach the end fed wire to that and raise it up. And uh, that works really well and, um, again, makes a real minimal impact on uh, any any park or where, where, wherever you may go for an activation. Um, and then the last thing that you can do, I don't have any pictures of it, but if you really want to go zero impact and get your mast up, you can just extend a mast and then lean it up against a tree and just kind of tangle it up in the branches. And then if a park ranger comes around, he can't complain about making any marks in the ground or putting any ropes in any tree, and you can still operate that way. So where there's a will, there's a way. There's a bunch of ways to do this with uh, minimal impact. And then uh, this is a picture of a, of an activation. This is Clara Barton Historical Site. And uh, on this day, we tossed a rope up in the tree using the um, arborist weight. So the, the wire itself for the end fed is it's running along here. So it's up in the tree somewhere. But uh, what I wanted to show was how we deal with the transformer. So in this case, this is another one of these um, portable electric fence posts just stuck in the ground. And we attach the, um, uh, the transformer here and then the feed line comes off and runs over to where we're operating. So really straightforward. Uh, here's another example. Sometimes we just, uh, if we have a tree nearby where we're operating, we'll just toss a cord over a branch and we'll suspend the transformer from, from a tree. And then again, the feed line will run to the station. And then here's another example. We were operating uh, on a lake and it was pretty cramped quarters. So we stuck the, um, the port, the uh, portable electric fence mast just right in the water there, just right next to the lake and, and then ran the feed line over into the station that we operated. And, uh, this was at Lake Brittle just down south of, uh, DC. So it, there's all different ways that, that you can deal with this. Um, there's one thing you do have to be careful of though, is that the, um, the hot point on these antennas, uh, because they're high voltage, um, have about 5,000 volts, uh, be, sorry, between two and 3,000 volts on the, um, uh, on the antenna output. So I like the sign. I thought it was funny, but, um, it, and it's a little, it's, it's a, it's a fair exaggeration, but I put it in here to make the point that, um, if, um, you, you need to make sure that strangers don't walk up and start fooling with the transformer when you're operating because you could get a real nasty, at least a real nasty RF burn and a good shock if you, if anybody should walk up and, grab one of these things while we're operating. So you need, you need to keep the muggles out, so to speak. Um, keep, keep them away from where you're operating. So that's the story on how we set them up and how we use them. And, um, I hope you can see from the operations that we've done, we've had a lot of success using these things. So Don, I know there's a lot of naysayers out there. But as I said, the proof is in the pudding. We've taken these things out, we've set them up, and we've used them, and we've had a lot of success with them. So 
Okay, so one of the things that, uh, if you remember uh, from my introductory comments, is that we wanted to homebrew something as well. We wanted to make it ourselves, and so I'm going to just spend a few minutes on uh, talking about how we build these things. So um, they're really pretty straightforward. This is a uh, schematic of how this thing, how these things work. Um, as I said earlier, the um, uh, what really makes this work is the 49 to one impedance transformer. And the wiring is basically like this. The feed line, um, the primary of the, um, of the transformer is wound around the toroid and then back to the, um, from the center feed to the, to the shield. And, uh, there is a, um, uh, a hundred picofarad, 10,000 volt capacitor put in there. You remember I said high voltage, low current. Again, hide the high voltage, a couple of thousand volts here. So we use 10 kV capacitors here. And these capacitors are put in to help with the tuning uh, because of some inductance in the primary to um, uh, to help with tuning of the antenna. And uh, and then the secondary of the transformer is um, connected to the, uh, the the half wave antenna itself. And uh, these wires are cut to um, half half a wavelength at the lowest frequency that uh, where you want to operate. So that that's how that works. And then again, if you read about or want to use a counterpoise, the counterpoise is attached to the, uh, to the ground here. And, uh, it's again 0.05 times uh, the, the wavelength of the lowest frequency that you're going to operate. Okay. So that was the schematic. So what does this look like from a practical point of view? Well, the way we make these things is we use, uh, toroids. They're ferrite toroids. Uh, made by the ferrite, uh, company. Uh, the ferrites, uh, the, the toroids that we use are called FT240 Mix 43. The 240 means these toroids are about two and a half inches in diameter. And the 43 refers to the mix that, uh, that is used to make the toroid. So toroids are, are made with different mixes of different metals and magic chemistry that makes these things work. So, and then the toroid itself is um, wrapped with the wires. So here, the primary and the secondary for the first couple of turns are um, uh, wound around each other to make a, a bifiller pair. And uh, the primary uh, is fed in the center. And as you saw earlier, uh, goes back to the ground side of the connector. And then the um, uh, the secondary is uh, one side is connected to ground and it it's wound around the uh, the toroid and then on the far end the antenna is connected here and then the turns ratio on this is uh two for two turns it's it's a 7 to 1 ratio and uh so for uh, if you have two turns on the primary there's 14 turns on the secondary to make it a uh 1 to 7 and then the 1 to 7 converts to uh, you square both sides and it, that that makes the 1 1 to 49 impedance transformer so so that's that's the basic structure of this thing um, when we wind the wires around the toroid, and again, you'll see an example in a second, we uh, wind the primary and secondary together for a couple of turns, and then the secondary is wound around seven times, and then what we do is we pass the um, the wire through the center and wrap it around for the rest of the turns. The reason we pass it through the center is so that uh, this antenna line, this antenna wire ends up on the opposite side of the toroid, which is, it just makes it easier to use. You could wrap it all the way around if you want or pass it through. It doesn't make any difference. What's important is that the wire passes through the center of the toroid to make a turn. Okay, so some design considerations on these. So the toroid of choice uh, depends on um, uh, that, that you use, that the toroid that you use affects the uh, primary uh, inductance and the efficiency of the transformer. And again, I don't understand all the science behind it, what, but what we know is that these transformers work best when the toroid mix is, it's a ferrite toroid mix is either 43 or 52. Now there are the, um, you know, the iron core toroids. They don't work. So you have to use the ferrite, uh, uh, flavor of, of toroids. And then the toroid size itself limits the, um, limits the power dissipation. So the more juice you use, the bigger, um, the, the, you, you need to use a bigger toroid or you can begin to stack toroids. Cause what happens is, is that there's always some loss of efficiency and you can get heating. And if the toroid gets too hot, then it stops doing its job. And, um, and then, then your transformer ultimately will fail. So, um, you can use a single FT140 toroid. These are toroids, the same mix, 
uh, that are about an inch and a half in diameter. You can use those uh, if you're not going to exceed 20 to 25 watts. And uh, for those, you can use three primary turns and 21 secondary turns. You still end up with a 1 to 49 ratio that way. Um, a single FT240-43 toroid works for 100 watts. And then, um, again, if you read the stuff that's out there, you'll see that people take more than one toroid and they'll stack two toroids, three toroids, four toroids on top of each other and and make these transformers. And folks get to the point where uh, you can uh, safely run up to a thousand watts with these things. You can you can go the, the full the full kahuna if you want. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the capacitor is there to compensate for the um, uh, inductance that um, that occurs uh, in in the transformer. Okay. All right. Well, this is an example of what what we have evolved to. Um, what what we started doing is Mike and I and some of the other guys in the club have three D printers, and so we we use uh, we three D print these holders that we use. Um, uh, for, um, our, for our antennas and our, our holder design has evolved over time. And this is the one that we're using right now. So, um, what we have here is we've got the, um, FT240, FT24043 mixed toroid here. This is a ferrite toroid. And then, um, these, the, the, these, uh, uh, this is the primary and, uh, and, and secondary windings of the transformer. Uh, one goes to the center of the feed line and the other side goes to ground. And then these are the windings of the toroid here. There's, uh, this is winding number eight going across all the way to number 14. And so this is the point where the, uh, antenna is attached to the, um, uh, to the device. And, uh, again, if you feel like you need to use a counterpoise, you can attach it here or here. Uh, or we, I put a hole in here so that if you want to use one, you can just connect it and then, uh, make it so that you can, um, add it or take it off whenever you want. So anyway, that's the basic design of, of these, uh, NFED half-wave antennas that we're using these days. This is a, a complete setup that I can drop in my bag. And, um, this is an example of it right here. So, uh, it's got the toroid and the transformer and, this is where the uh, feed line attaches. And then the nice thing about this is um, we can get away with using the PolyStealth 26 antenna wire, so it's really lightweight, but it's strong enough to stand up to what we're operating with, and the diameter is small enough so that it wraps very nicely uh, onto the um, uh, onto this winder. So not only is, does this hold the toroid, not only does it have a spot for connecting the feed line, not only does it have numerous points for uh, hang it up wherever we want to. It also serves as a nice winder for the antenna wire whenever we're done. And then this just drops into my bag whenever, whenever I want to, whenever I leave the house, I take it out, set it up and use it and then wind it back up and drop it in the bag. So we can pass that around and that's a 40. Yeah. So let me take this one for just a second. This was, you saw this one in, in some of the pictures. This is one of our earlier designs. Um, this is more like, uh, the one that so the soda beams folks use. So this is again, something that, uh, we came up with and we started using this. This has an FT, uh, 14043, uh, transformer in it. And, uh, the wind on this is, um, uh, there's three turns on the on the primary and 21 turns on the secondary. So this is uh, again one to 49, but slightly slightly different design from our from our earlier days. And then the other thing that you can do is uh, for the um, uh, for the vertical antennas, um, I, I I put the uh, transformer just in this little box. So again, this is another little 3D printed box. And, uh, I labeled it on the bottom. You, this is where you hook the antenna and then the feed line goes here. And, um, I have one with a lid on it. I'll pass them both around in just a second. But, um, what I'll do is I'll put a 20 meter wire. Um, I'll attach it to the top of the 10 meter mast and run it up. And then this just sits on the ground at the base of the vertical. Remember the vertical thing that I showed you a few minutes ago? And then it operates uh, on 20 meters or if I pull the link on 15 meters very nicely. So. Um, that's, that's the box. And then this is, um, this is where I need the wireless mic, but, uh, this is a little winder that, uh, I, I printed that, um, holds the feed line whenever I use it with the little box. And it's got just a nice little thingy on it here. 
I just unspool it and attach it to the antenna. When I'm done, I just wind it up and throw it in the bag. And then uh, this is Mike's big kahuna. This is uh, <laughs> Mike. Uh, Mike printed this one. Um, Katie for Mike. Mike. And uh, this is a kite binder from a Thingiverse model that he got. And this this has uh, enough wire on it for an 80, 80 meter um, and fed half wave. So, yeah. So this is the one we used on field day. So uh, anyway, those that, those are the, the the antennas that we use. Um, I'll pass these around. A couple of more. These are the winders here that uh, we've made. So yeah, that's the box. I've showed you the box. So I use that with the vertical antenna. Now, if you want to make one of these things, this is a slide that shows all the parts that are uh, used in one of these things. Um, again, it's not a lot. Um, we got the toroid. We've got the holder. We've got. Uh, the wire, uh, a couple of zip ties, and then some hardware, an SO239 connector, and, and then, of course, the capacitor. And um, if you want to make one of these things, I, I've got kind of a cookbook here in case you want to, again, use this uh, presentation afterwards. Um, you cut about 1.2 meters or 3 feet and 11 inches of wire and then uh, fold uh, one end back about 220 millimeters and then just uh, wind it so that it it forms a... Uh, by filler twist, and then it's best to leave about 60 millimeters of a tail here. And then um, once you've got that done, you just start winding it around the toroid. So uh, leave enough of the twisted pair uh, sticking out here so that you can attach it to the um, ground side of the SO239 connector and wrap it around a couple of times. And then this is the um, the part that goes into the uh, center feet of the SO239. And then the rest of it wraps around just like the picture I showed you. So that's it. It's really simple to do. It's not, not it's something that is just really, really easy. Uh, the other thing that we do is they're a little hard to see here, but we'll often use uh, little zip ties to hold the, the wires in place um, while we're winding them. It just kind of helps hold it all together. And then uh, just drop it. We I drop it in the form, and I kind of figure out where I need to cut the wires. And you got to clean the enamel off the wire, otherwise you, you don't get the connection or burn or burn it off or whatever. And then uh, we crimp these um, uh, little connectors on there. I put a little touch of solder on these because um, you know I know they're going to these antennas are going to be out in the field, and I just want to make sure that I've got a good electrical connection. And then uh, just mount the rest of the gear and uh, and the and solder the capacitor. The capacitor is hello hard to see, but it's right here. And uh, off we go. And that's that's the finished product then when it's all ready to go. So it's really really easy to build these things. All right. And uh, this is it in operation. So that's uh, again on one of those um, uh, portable uh, um, electric fence posts, just hanging there and. You can see where the feed line is heading off to the station, and then the uh, end fed wire is up uh, on a rope that's tossed into a tree. So that's that's how it works. Really, really straightforward. Okay, um, so time to wrap up here. So a couple of conclusions, and I'm just going to really breeze through some sources and references so that you can uh, get at them. So just to end, this antenna really meet, met the performance criteria that I laid out at the beginning of the presentation. Small size, easy to deploy, small, uh, low impact footprint, multi-band, homebrew, good performance. And by the way, you can even use these things at home if you want. So uh, I have a couple in my backyard and, uh, they, they work pretty well for me. So, um, uh, you can make them portable. If you do, if you do set them at home, you, uh, you really need to put your transformer in a good waterproof box. And, you know, I wouldn't recommend using these outdoors, but you can use the general concept at home if you want. Okay. One, one thing I did want to mention is that there's another kind of end fed antenna that you'll hear about. It's called the random random wire or random length and fed antennas. And this is not the same as the end fed half wave that we're talking about. Um, the antenna wire that's used in these random length and fed antennas are not resonant on any of the frequencies that um, you operate on. And they employ a nine to one uh, impedance matching transformer as opposed to the one to 49 uh, the ant an antenna tuner is required and a counterpoise is required. And, you know, there are some people that really like these antennas. I can't comment on them because I've never used one. So um, I think um, Howard has used one and 
uh, others have used them here. So, but it's, it's, I just wanted to mention it because it's out there and, uh, just wanted to acknowledge that. So I put together a bill of materials for the NFED half wave. If you have a 3D printer and you want to make one of these, uh, mounts, um, I put the, uh, the winder, um, on, um, printables. It's the, uh, Prussia, uh, website. So you can download the, uh, STL file and, uh, make one yourself. And then this is just a list of the ingredients, uh, uh, in the, uh, antenna. This is the, uh, the big pieces. And then these are the little bits and bobs of hardware that you need. So you can refer to that later if you want. Um, other sources for the telescopic mass where you can get them. Uh, where you can get the port, the portable electric fence posts and so forth. So again, if you want to find them, there's references there for them. And that references on the antenna itself. Um, there's a lot of information about these antennas on, um, YouTube. One of the, uh, leading lights, I suppose you could call him in, uh, the NFED half wave world is a gentleman named Steve Ellington. He's got several, uh, YouTube videos out there. And there's a real nice paper that, um, where I got started that was written by this gentleman, Steve Dick at K1RF. Um, he's, he's written a real nice paper that goes through, um, more of the theory and, and how to set these up. So it's a really nice reference, but there's tons of stuff out there. And I would encourage you if you're interested just to do a Google search and, and, um, and learn more about them. So that's the story this evening. I hope you found it interesting. And, um, if you have any questions, uh, Mike and I would be happy to answer them. So thanks very much. Yeah, time for maybe one or two questions. Yeah, Frank, Franco? Franco? Yeah. No, just, just uh, curiosity because uh, I, I have to say that a lot of QRP and Fed use different toroids. The one I I never tried one. But what is the reason for the toroids? Because those are not ferrite. The, the one that Pac Antenna uses, they are much more solar and they are uh, iron. They are different. They are the T50, whatever they are. So have you ever tried it? Um, I, I never have tried anything different than these. Um, I recently came across, I, I wish I remember the reference. It's a gentleman in, uh, in Scotland who, um, uh, has done a couple of YouTube videos recently where he's he's tried to measure the efficiency of these transformers, and he's using he's used ferrite toroids. They're ferrite, so it's the FT something uh, dash forty three, and the ones that he was using are are is smaller in diameter, and they're a little taller, maybe something something like this. Um, but the uh, oh, are they? Oh, okay, all right. So Don has gotten some and. Um, but if you if you watch his videos, um, he <laughs> these these look like the ones he was using. Are these ferrite? Are these uh, uh, they're, they're whatever he said to you? So. Okay, all right. <laughs> Don, Don, yeah, I know they're hard to get, so I might, you know. <laughs> but but uh, he he claims that these are more efficient than than the other. But I don't know. So um, I'll I'll send you the link. You can take a look at it. It feels more efficient. <laughs> But I, I have never, I have never tried using the iron core toroids at all, you know, and, 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 you know, the nine to one toroids use those. They use like the, like the, what is it? The, um, oh, the, it, it's uh, the, it's a nine to one balance. Yeah. It's powdered iron. They're red. They're used, they're, they use the red ones. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, they're using the, in, in, in different applications. Anything that I've read says don't use anything but the, uh, ferrite toroids. And I've never tried, I've just never tried using them, so I haven't bothered. So I can't answer that. So uh, other questions, Mike? Well, I'm on the 140, the lower power one, are you using a higher higher number of turns? Same ratio, but higher number of turns. Blindings. I'm going to turn to my electrical engineer colleague here. Yeah. <laughs> Smaller core, you know, lower permeability and, you know, lower inductance. So not a, not able to handle as much uh, flux. Lower flux density, so to boost that, you need to use more windings, right, Lee? Okay, all right. <laughs> we'll turn to the real electrical engineer here. So, so the rule of thumb for any transformer like this is you want the inductance of your core to be at least ten times that of the impedance. So, you're matching fifty ohms on the primary. You want about five hundred ohms of reactance. 
So if you have a smaller core, it has a lower AL factor, less vulnerability, you need more turns to get the idealized at least 500 ohms of reactance. This also means if you try to build one for 160 meters, you're going to need more turns because, again, as you go down on frequency, you know, your reactance is going to drop. So you need more turns as you go down. So in theory, an 80 versus 40 meter one, ideally with the same core, would also need more turns for 80 than 40. So that's the reason why you have to adjust your turns ratio based on your frequency and the size of the core. You you often use it as a sloper. Did you ever try to have an inverted V? Because I saw some QRPers using inverted V. Do you see the difference? Um, you you can use them. Uh, most in the vast, I'll just say in the vast majority of the operations, we uh, use a straight line wire. I have an inverted L at home that I have cut for 80 meters, so I run it straight up and then to a tree over the roof of my house to a tree in the front yard. That works just fine. So so that works fine. Okay. Just real quick, the other thing, if you're interested in odd configurations, there's a good website called the Bent Dipole, and it'll 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 walk you through modeling of things like using an NFED as an inverted V and things like that. All right. The online question? On the question of uh, QRP with these end-fed half waves, I did it for years with a two-watt transmitter on field day and often came in in a top 12 in my class, which was 1A battery at the time. Uh, the reason for powdered iron cores uh, and not using them is they are conductive. They'll flash over. I've had a lot of problems like that. My final comment is my first antenna was a half-wave 66-foot wire running from my second-floor bedroom window out to a pole in the yard. I was in Pennsylvania at the time. I would work Australia. Yeah, excellent. And um, yeah, when the band conditions are good, and uh, we, we worked Hawaii on our, our winter field day as well. So we, they do work. They work very nicely. So thanks, thanks for the comments, Mike. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Really appreciate the attention this evening, and please join the build group, okay? Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll let Don tell his story. Don, Don, Don is an experienced NFED half-wave user, too, and he's got him to work both attached to the radio and not attached to the radio, I think. <laughs> so he'll tell us that story.